Yes, I'm back. <laughs> I can see a lot of you are smiling because you know, hey, when this guy is here, 10 minutes and it's home time. Okay, <laughs> but let's see where the Lord leads, right? Uh, yes, welcome to the last Sunday, and the last day of the year, the last service. What a time to be grateful and thankful, amen? For me personally, it wasn't the best year, but it was not a bad year as well. And uh, God remains faithful. He has seen us through, and that's why I'm grateful and thankful this morning. And uh, if you look around, you follow the news, you'll see many reasons to be thankful and grateful this morning. Amen. Okay. Um, yes, uh, thank you to, uh, thankful for this, uh, to God for this, another opportunity to bring his message. Uh, thanks to Pastor in his absence, Church Council as well for this opportunity. And uh, with that being said, Let's get into the Word of God. Okay, this morning the theme of my message, or the title, is a question. Right? And the question is, do you want to change your life? Do you want to change your life? Right? For, the, for Christ, or for the better, change is good. You know, we all have questions that we would like to ask God one day, right? And... Has it ever happened to you where you feel that, you know, things have happened and then you said, okay, you, in your mind you think, it says, okay, when I get to heaven, I'll ask God, why, why did he let this happen? Then, but uh, this morning, God also has questions for you. And we're going to get that, we're going to get into that a bit. When I'm, um, my scripture reading is from the book of John, Gospel of John, chapter 5. Okay, so before, we, before I read that, uh, while I was preparing, I found this on, on the net, on the net. Okay, so it was like a survey or a poll done a few years ago, and a question was asked. Speaking of questions, right? So what will adults ask God or a supreme being if they could get a direct answer on the spot? Right? So 19% wanted to know, will, will there be life after death? Right? 6% wanted to know, how long will I live? And 34% wanted to know, what's my purpose here? Okay, so those are good questions. To answer them quickly, I will, will, will we have life of death? Absolutely. The answer is, uh, the way I see it, you have two options. It's either smoking, non-smoking. That the choice is, even though I have the choice is yours, entirely up to you. Right? And number two, how long will I live? Uh, I don't know the answer to that one. Only God knows. Okay? And the last one, what is my purpose here? I believe our purpose here is to know God and to bring Him glory. Amen. Now let's think about the questions that God has for us. Right? Okay, so you can turn your Bibles to John chapter 5 now. While you're turning there, just a, a quick summary. This is a story of a man in a seemingly hopeless situation. Uh, abandoned, uncared for, and unable to help himself. And desperately lonely. Right? So Jesus comes, you will read, Jesus comes to this man and asks him a question. And a question, in fact, I think that God is asking all of us. Okay, so I'm going to read uh, from verse 1 to 18. There's a lot of verses, but I'll quickly read for us. So it's John chapter, chapter 5, verse 1 to 18. Right? So uh, in your Bibles, you'll see the heading is the healing at the pool or the pool of Bethesda. Right? So reading from verse 1. Later on, there was another festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem is a pool called Bethesda in Hebrew. It has five quarters. And under these, a large number of sick people were lying blind, lame, or paralyzed, waiting for the movement of the water. At certain times, an angel of the Lord would go down into the pool and stir up the water, and whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was healed of whatever disease he had. One particular man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? The sick man answered, sir, I don't have anyone to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. While I'm trying to get there, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. The man immediately became well, and he picked up his mat and started walking. Now, that day was a Sabbath. So the Jewish leaders told the man who had 
being healed, it is a Sabbath and it is lawf not lawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered them, the man who made, made me well told me, pick, pick up your mat and walk. They asked him, who is the man who told you, pick it up and walk? But the one who had been healed did not know who it was, because Jesus had slipped away from the crowd in that place. Later on, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, look, you have become well. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went off and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. So the Jewish leaders began persecuting Jesus because he kept doing such things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I too am working. So the Jewish leaders were trying all the harder to kill him because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own father, thereby making himself equal to God. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy word. Okay, so you see, we see some kind of momentum here from Jesus. Um, he was on some kind of schedule, like a sort of schedule. Uh, he had people to heal, words to share, and lives to impact. And people needed his healing touch. So he was moving according to some kind of schedule. Right? He had appointments set long ago in the Council of Eternity. And by the way, Jesus always keeps his appointments. Amen? So basically here he's making, he's ultimately, ultimately making his way to the cross. So we see a momentum, right? And in the same, the same way in, in your life, God is leading you as a Christian. He's leading us as Christians, right? And as Christians, we don't believe in coincidence. We should believe what we believe in providence, right? Uh, it's very important and it's a very common habit that we have or that we say most of the time is like, uh, oh, I was lucky today or I was lucky yesterday. Well, I don't believe in luck. I believe in the Lord's leading, or the Holy Spirit's guiding and protection. Right? So, getting back to the story, the Lord was moving on a schedule here. Right? Chron chronologically, he has already been rejected in his hometown of Nazareth. Uh, he has healed many, including a demon-possessed man, Peter's mother-in-law, a leper, as well as a paralytic. Right? But the man that Jesus was healing here in John chapter 5, this healing was going to cost him, in fact, it's a turning point of Christ's ministry because at this stage, the religious leaders were upset, they were furious. And uh, they wanted to, because for them it was a mysterious man, who's this mysterious man from Galilee? They wanted to kill him now. And plus, what made it worse, it was, this, it was the seven. And so this ultimately cost him his life, right? And uh, that's the reason why, and what, what's another reason why they were so ticked off? Is because if you, let's look at verse 17, right? Let's read. But Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now, and I too am working. So here yeah, he's claiming to be equal with God. And that ticked off the religious leaders. It really ticked them. And for that, they, they decided and they wanted to kill him. So, and also this is a story of a lonely man as well, right? So, uh, and another thing I want you all to notice in this passage is Jesus often sought out the lonely. He, uh, it was almost as if he was drawn to lonely people. And like the woman at the well as well. And uh, like Zacchaeus was up in the tree and like this man here that we see. And, you know, if you look around, there's so many peop lonely people out there right now at this moment. And uh, sometimes you might be uh, very successful and lonely. You might be very unsuccessful and lonely. But everyone experience, I think everyone experiences it at a stage. You know, I think, I think the way we were designed or uh, born, created by God, is that we have this compartment of loneliness in us sometimes. Right? And... Uh, so, getting back to the pool of the water, so there's the man in our story. So, there was a story, or let's call it a local legend, in the community that believed that an angel would actually come from time to time, stir up the waters, and whoever gets in the water, and whatever affirmities they had, sickness, and they would be cleansed or healed off, right? So, and the, the people, well, there's no actual evidence to support this. But anyways, the people and the community believed it. 
and you can't blame a man for hope. So there's this man and many others believe, right? And he had been paralyzed for 38 years, unable to get out of the situation he was in. Now, we don't know how the paralysis took place, whether it was an accident or that led to the paralysis, or whether he was born that way. But we just know that he was paralyzed. And we do know, if you read verse 3, there were a lot of sick people in, in, this, in this town, right? So, Christ makes a statement in verse 14. Uh, I want you all to take note of this as well. He makes a very uh, serious statement. He says, stop sinning or something even worse will happen to you. Now, this was after the man was healed, right? was better. So, for me, this indicates that there's some uh, link between his personal sin and uh, to the condition that he was in. So, but just now, just to be clear, I'm not saying that if you have a disability or if you are sick, it's because of this of the sin in your life and you're being punished. We all know it's, that's because of the curse. We uh, sin entered the world through Adam, and uh, we know that's uh, we uh, we get all these things. We get we are unable to at certain stages in our life. We're unable to do things. We uh, we experience sickness, and we experience the death experience as well. Uh, if Adam had not sinned, man would have never died. So we have to go through this thing. So don't get me wrong here, but the way Jesus is telling him in this verse, it links something between his condition and his sin, the sin in his life, right? So in broad sense, all illness is result from sin. Okay. So what Jesus is saying, in this man's case, that there was a direct link between his sin and the condition he was. So that's fascinating to me. I want you to notice that all he had to do was ask for God's help. Sometimes, you know, the only thing that's stopping us from receiving God's healing or God's blessing is a simple request. It's sometimes a part as we come from our side. We have to do our part. And the Bible says, you have not because you ask not. Now sometimes you'll ask God and God will say no. And now that's, no is an answer by the way, and, but it's not the answer we want to hear. So, but it's still an answer. Remember? And sometimes God wants to say yes, but it comes down to the simple truth, you have not because you ask not. So sometimes, you know, we just have to keep praying about it. Pray about it again and again. And because Jesus said, keep asking, keep seeking, and keep knocking, and the door will be open. So the Lord might say, after a time, don't ask me anymore. My grace is sufficient for you, just like he told Paul as well. Huh? But then again, the Lord might say, I am going to do that for you. And that's what he did for this man. Sorry. And I think it was the helplessness of this man that actually drew Jesus to him. Maybe the man prayed or groaned a prayer, you never know, that, uh, you know, send, the, send an angel to stir up the waters uh, today or then maybe pray the previous night so then I can get to the water and be healed because they believe them. And they literally know that the angel was not going to come, but God was actually going to heal him and make him and change his life. And... Uh, not only physically, but spiritually as well. So this man's life was basically transformed. Uh, and it's sad when you look at this group of people. I want you to look at verse 3. I'll read verse 3 for us quickly. And out of these, a large number of sick people were lying blind, lame, or paralyzed, waiting for the movement of the water. Now the word paralyzed can be translate, translated without strength, or oh, hopeless or powerless. And that's a picture of all of us before we were Christians and paralyzed with our sin. Um, Romans 5 verse 6 says, While we were without strength, Christ died for us. Amen? Sometimes people will say that, you know, God helps those who help themselves. Have you ever heard that? Very common saying as well. But uh, I hate to break it to you, that one is not biblical. No, 
as a truth or is there's nothing scriptural about that. And uh, in, in a way or in a sense, if you look at it, uh, you can say God helps the helpless. He helps the helpless. Right? Another one is godliness is next to cleanliness. And, okay, good, that's a good habit or practice or something to teach your kids, but also not scriptural, right? Uh, look at verse 6. So hope you still have your Bibles turned to John 5. Okay, verse 6. Okay, Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time. Uh, now, isn't that interesting? The, the Bible says there was a great multitude and Jesus saw him. It doesn't say Jesus saw them, but obviously he must have seen them as he was walking past, but he saw him specifically. There was something, like I said, something specific that draw, drew this man or drew Jesus to this man. And I want you to take note as well, the Lord asked the man a very interesting question. And the question is, would you like to get well? It seems strange that Jesus asks man this question because he had been paralyzed for 38 years. So that the obvious answer would be, yes, I want to get well. But it's also a very good question because not everybody said, but not everybody wants to get better. Not everybody wants to have their lives changed by God. There are some people who just like or enjoy the state that they are in. And did you know that? They just enjoy it. It's like sometimes you feel sorry when you look at the person like, I hope you can break away from that drug addiction or that alcoholism or whatever is gambling, whatever strongholds, on, please break free. But guess what? Not necessarily. We might feel that way, but they actually enjoy it. it you have, that's why I say you have to do your part. The part has to come from you and only you can decide and make that change in your life and you can try all of your interventions all of the sermons all of the attempts to convince them isn't going to work if they themselves don't want to change right? that's why the question that jesus asks man is a valid question he asks do you want to be made well because the man could have said no uh, let me just stay here paralyzed you know and for the sake of the the title for the sake of the title of the message is do you want to be made well or do you want to change your life or do you want your life to change huh? do you really want it because if you don't want it nothing is really going to happen and like i said some people are comfortable in a state that i um didn't want to use this example but anyways like a pig in a pig style have you seen pigs how they do so do you know why pigs like pig style by the way you know, I always thought they were, uh, they go there, I know they co go to cool themselves off, but you know, a, pe a pig doesn't sweat. I only found that out while I was preparing this message. A pig doesn't sweat. Maybe that's why the bacon is so salty. Huh? So, <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm just joking anyway. Yeah, so pigs, pigs don't sweat. Have you ever seen a pig sweat? So, yeah, they don't sweat. They're pretty much relaxed. Life's good for a pig. And uh, they don't have to take a bath or shower. And they go to the pig side to cool themselves is because that's their sweet spot. They like it. They actually enjoy it. And you see some people, uh, got nothing against people keeping pigs as pets, but some people keep uh, pigs as pets and then they get them cleaned up and knit some sweaters or jerseys and all for them and then take them. I've seen, I've seen actually some people take the pig to the beach and I'm like, wow. <laughs> so anyways, the pig's not happy. The, all the pig wants to do is get back into the sty and cool off and relax there. That's how some people are uh, in our Christian, in our life. We don't want to make that change. We're happy or content. We enjoy the state. And that's a state of darkness. And the real reason, do you know the real reason that people don't want to come to Christ? Some people will say, I don't want to become a Christian because I, I believe in evolution. Or I don't want to become a Christian. Christians are hypocrites and so on. You hear the excuses. These are all excuses. It's all excuses. So the answer, I want to read John 3, verse 19 to 20. The answer to that question is in John 3. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it for but you can if you want to. So it's John 3, verse 19 and 20. And this is Jesus talking. And this is the basis for judgment. 
The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness more than the light because their actions were evil. Everyone who practices wickedness hates the light and does not come to the light. So that is, actions may not be exposed. That's the, that's the real answer to that, that question. Why many people want to become Christians, want to become, come to Christ. They just come up with a whole lot of excuses. And deep down people know that there is a judgment. I think even I think when Robert was doing his message as well, he said, even an animal or a dog knows, as he was a pet, a dog, and knows sometimes when they do when they when they have done wrong, when they have done something wrong. And they know it. And they know they have to answer to their sins or for their sins. So they don't want to hear about it, they don't want, don't want us to tell them anything about it, and they are comfortable where they are in the dark, the darkness. Okay, so um, I was reading a story while I was preparing. So back in the days, the history books will tell us that there was a castle uh, in uh, Paris called Bastille, a uh, dungeon castle. So a man was trapped there for many, many years. Right? Uh, not, not trapped, sorry, imprisoned. And uh, when the time came for his freedom, and uh, when he was free to go, he actually begged the people to take him back and put him in the dungeon. And the radiance, apparently the radiance of the sun was too bright for him. But just look at that example, and many people are like that today. They're just comfortable in the dark. They'd rather be in the darkness of eternal death than the light of the gospel. Like I said, it's sad, but it's a reality. And this one, I, there was a man called Oswald Chambers, and he said, and I quote, Sin enough, and you will soon be unconscious of sin. Sin enough and you will soon be unconscious of sin." End quote. So Jesus asked this man, let's get back to the story, Jesus asked this man, do you really want to be made well? Right? And uh, he could ask the same of us. Do you want your marriage healed? Do you want to be healed? Do you want uh, provision, uh, finances? You know, uh, you can ask that. Do you want to be free from that addiction? You can ask that of us. So the question remains, do you really want to change the course of your life? Mm -hmm. Well, there's God's part and there's your part. Okay, uh, let's look at verse 7. The sick man answered him, Sir, I don't have anyone to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. While I'm trying to get there, someone else steps down ahead of me. Okay, so he says, yeah, to the question, to Jesus' question, he says, I can, sir, but I have no one to put me in the pool, right? Every time uh, the waters get stirred up, there's always some, because he's paralyzed, he, he can't make it there on his own. No one puts him in the water, so someone always ends up beating him to it. And again, many people are like this today as well. They say, I want to change, but I don't know how. And sometimes, especially with this story, it's not about getting in the pool. Because Jesus can touch you right now and change your life, right? Amen? We just have to be willing. And I want you to take note of Jesus' response here. Jesus asks for three things. He shows him how he can change, right? So number one, Jesus asks the impossible. Number two, he removes all possibility of a relapse. And number three, he expects continued success. Right? So we're going to go to quickly through those three points. By, by me saying he asked the impossible, he asked the man to do something that he has not been able to do for 38 years. A man has been paralyzed for 38 years. I mean, if someone tells you, get up, take up your mat or your bed and walk, they must be wondering what's going on here, you know? Because for 38 years he's been in that state. So he asked the impossible. That's what I mean by he asked the impossible. But good news, nothing is impossible with God. Amen? When God asks you to do something, you can do it because with God, nothing is impossible. Like how Peter walked in the water for a short time. He, uh, when Jesus said, come, uh, when Peter said, Lord, is that you? Yes, come forward. He walked. It wasn't a very long time. It was a short time, but he walked on the water. Number two, Jesus removes all possibility of a relapse. And by me saying this, I want you to take note. See, he, he says, pick up your bed and walk. He doesn't say, get up, walk, leave your bed in case you change your mind and you want to come back and be paralyzed. 
says you pick up your bed and walk. And he's basically saying, you know, you are, you're not, you are done here. And you know, I have this colleague at work when we, we start, we do shift work. So whenever we start, we do the shift one to nine. And you know, he's always got this very exciting uh, personality and uh, it's always joy and very patient guy as well. So anytime we come, we start at one, we start at one and we always work, that's a common shift we work together. By two o'clock, he'll say, ah, Mr. Keegan, this thing is done. This day is done. He's been saying this year is done, I think somewhere in September. So, you know, <laughs> that, that's what I'm saying is basically Jesus was saying this, you are, you are done, your life has been changed, you know, pick up your bed and walk. So there's no, there's no possibility for a relapse. In the same way, when we come to Christ, we make a break with our past and it's a good thing to burn our bridges. Amen. And like a uh, common example, Elijah and Elisha, we threw the mantle over Elisha, the bridges were burned. And Elijah knew he wasn't coming back. They cut up the plow, killed the oxen, and they ate the food. They ate the food. And you see a lot of people make a commitment to follow Christ, but they never make that break with their past. They drag their past with them. Right? Well, I just want to share one more story with you. Uh, this one I read as well. So I don't know how old the story, but apparently it's based on a true story. So anyways, there was a guy that, uh, that dealt drugs, he was a drug dealer, right? So he wanted to change his life or turn his life around. And then he actually, uh, he used to, it was back in the days, why is it back in the days? He had a pager. Now for those that, for youngsters, especially for those that don't know what's a pager, a pager was a device, like a size of a cell phone, cell phone or half the size of a cell phone. You would keep it with you and someone would page you and you would see that number and you would go to probably a pay phone or phone and, and phone that number or for the older people if you had that phone that turns like that that you would use that phone to phone that number so anyways he, for him he wanted to burn his bridge he handed so they had they were he went to some kind of crusade and he handed the pastor over uh, his pager and he says you know what i'm a drug dealer and this and that i don't want to do this anymore i don't want to deal drugs so the pastor took it and then i think the next day was uh, in the same week just after the crusade so the pastor phoned him and said, you know what, uh, phone to check on you. The same pastor that he gave the pager to. So the pastor said, are you doing everything? He says, no, I'm mowing the lawn. Then he says, okay, nice, doing some uh, some yard work, you know, just to keep your mind off the things. He says, no, no, I'm literally mowing the lawn because I have to, I got a lot of marijuana plants, I have to mow them down. So that's, that's burning your bridges, you see? <laughs> okay, and have you heard people say, that they tried Christianity and it didn't work out for them. I've heard that a lot. Yes, they are. They say they tried Christianity and it didn't work out for them. So that's a lie. Because Christianity is not a product that works for some and doesn't work for others. It's because they didn't do their part. Number three, Jesus expects continued success, right? From especially from this man. He says, walk and do you know, don't expect to be carried. He had to do his part. That man could have just said uh, to Jesus, I can't walk, carry me, or still believe that of the water, carry me to the water. But he got up and he walked. When Jesus said, get up and walk, pick up your bed and walk. So if Christianity didn't work out for those people that said they tried Christianity, that's not on God, that's on them. And in the same way of being a Christian, we don't work for our salvation. That's a gift of God. But if you're a Christian, you live it out. The Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So the question still remains, do you want to change? Or do you want your life to be changed? Or are you, are you where you need to be spiritually? Another question God asked back in the garden was, uh, if you read Genesis, Remember he asked Adam, where are you? Now obviously God knew where Adam was, but they were hiding. So God asked Adam, where are you? And this was after they had sinned and eaten the fruit. Now you'll ask yourself, why, why did God ask that question? Because God knew exactly where Adam was. But yet Adam was hiding. And that's like playing hide and seek with kids. Have you, have you ever played hide and seek? Or have you ever seen kids, young kids play hide and seek? They don't know deception yet. They, you'll find kids going and hiding behind the curtain, but you can see their shoes. 
and that's hide and seek. So that's how, that's what it looks when we hide from God. You know, some I think some kids when they block their eyes, they think they're hiding. So that's what it is for us when we. That's how it looks. That's how silly it looks when we hide. Think we're hiding from God, because God knows. And all God wanted that time, I'm sure He just wanted a confession from Adam. It says not. He didn't want information. He just wanted a confession. Adam to come out and say, you know, God, we have we have broken the rule. We have eaten the fruit. Maybe things would have changed. And God can ask the same question of us right now. He can ask, where are you? Well, you can say, uh, I'm in church, waiting for Keegan to finish preach his message. And, but that's not what I mean. Right? So where are you? Where are you spiritually? Are you where you need to be as a Christian right now? And if you had to ask me that, my answer will be yay and nay. Yes and no. On one hand, I'm, I'm where I need to be in Christ. I have trust in him. I know he's my savior and lord. But am I, am I where I should be or could be? More stronger in Christ, more knowledge. Uh, for me, that would be the nay part. So in the same way, I can say I am where I want to be, but I'm not quite where I want to be yet. Even the apostle Paul, after many years of walking with the Lord, uh, he says, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid all of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on forward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's Philippians 3 by 3. So, in closing or in conclusion, there's the smiles now. Okay. So, see for tomorrow, for so, tomorrow some it's a new year. For some, it's a new day. Just another day or a, another week. Right? For God, it's irrelevant. Irrelevant, not in a bad sense. In a sense that there's no time or formality with God. God doesn't follow a calendar. Right? And the choice is ours. The question still remains, do you want to change your life? We need to play our part and pick up our bed and walk like a paralyzed man. The choice is ours to change. Our life. Change is good. Change, change for the better because I don't see change. Okay, there is possible change for the better, but change for the better. Change is good. Uh, everything changes. You see, this season changes for plantation. We are born a certain way. We grow. We get stronger, and we get weaker again. And uh, it's it's change. The change we we get the death experience. Like I said, it's all part of change, and uh, it's up to you. You have to play your part and make the choice. The choice is yours. And, and another thing to note as well is that uh, even the Bible says we are a new creature. King James says new creature, new creation when we are born again. And um, you see our understanding changes as well. From 20, okay, say from 10 to 19, your understanding is different. From the ages of 20 to 29, it's different. From 30 to 39, it's different. 40 to 49, going on and on and on. You understanding, you mature, you change for the better. Most people change for the better. And change for the most important thing is we should change for Christ. Because Christ died for us. And uh, that's the main thing. The, the choice is ours. Uh, to Amen. Okay, I hope you are blessed with that word. And uh, I'm going to close in prayer. And as the band makes their way up. Okay. Let's pray. Dear Lord, our gracious Heavenly Father, we just come before you in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Lord, we, we just thank you, Lord, yet for another day of your grace, your mercies, your loving kindness, your love, Lord, in our lives. Uh, we are so grateful and thankful uh, for this day, for this year that has gone past, Lord, Father. Uh, we we thankful that we serve a living and a righteous God. There is none like you, Lord. You have no equal, you have no rival, Lord Father. And uh, we know, Lord, that you are in control. It's all about you. It's not about us, Lord. We just fit into the picture sometimes. And it's all about you. We need to bring you, Lord. I just thank you, Lord, for whatever has been said um, and done, Lord, that your message may go out and change the hearts of men, Lord Father. And uh, thank you for creating us with free choice, Lord Father. But let us make that choice for the better, Lord Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that... 
uh, teaches us and guides us, guides us as well, Lord Father. Thank you for everything that you do for us. And uh, even as we further tarry, continue, we just give you all the glory and praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.